thanks Jeff for that introduction. Uh, thanks to Matt Doyley and uh, Mark Wilson for the invitation to be here. Uh, thanks to you all for your interest. Congratulations to Jim Childress for this Praxis Award. Um, I've known Professor Childress uh, for 46 years now. I've been an undergraduate in a class of his in 1971 and 72. So if you ever doubt uh, the power of effective teaching and mentoring and uh, example in the profession, uh, just think about his life and work and career. I'm very grateful to be here and I look forward to our discussion. Uh, this afternoon I'll be talking about moral discourse about war and about Childress's contribution to that discourse. So it may help to briefly sketch the prevailing framework in the ethics of war, namely the just war tradition. <clears throat> the just war tradition is a body of moral wisdom for evaluating a particular a political community's use of organized force and for distinguishing between just and unjust wars. <coughs> it's premised on the idea that war can be just and provides criteria for determining whether a particular war is justified. The tradition has us think about the decision to go to war and about decisions in the course of war, producing two categories, the use ad bellum and the use in bellum. These two categories consist of criteria that have us address two questions. The first question is, when is going to war justified? This question is addressed by the use ad bellum which specifies when it is right to enter war. When we consider war's cause, authority, purpose, timing, risks, and likelihood of success, we're thinking in use of high-development terms. The second question is, <coughs> what actions in war are justified? Here we focus on military decisions, military practice, and professional formation. Here we ask what forms of killing in war were justified, and when is killing in war murderous? The use in bellow requires soldiers and planners to use force in discriminate and proportionate ways. This category has its focus on the rules of engagement, the need to avoid civilian casualties, and the proper treatment of prisoners. Some exponents of the just war tradition today are arguing for a third category, namely the use ad bell, focusing on post-war justice. Here we ask, what are the victors' post-war rights and obligations? How do we think about the ethics of interim or transitional situations? Now, in the 1970s, Professor Childress made an important contribution to just war thinking be the object of my thoughts today. He's had his focus on the conceptual relationship between just war criteria and pacifism. Typically, we say that pacifists reject war as a morally acceptable means of resolving political disputes. Pacifists are anti-war. Just war theorists, we say, claim that war can be justified under certain strict conditions. Seen in this way, pacifism and just war doctrine represent two opposing frameworks for the ethics of war. But on Childress's formulation, there's actually an underlying connection between pacifism and just war doctrine. Namely, the idea that both frameworks share a common starting point. According to Childress, pacifism and just war doctrine both presume the priority of nonviolence to violence. Just war theorists, no less than pacifists, desire nonviolent resolutions to political conflict. Those are preferred. Resort to war should occur only as a last resort after efforts at political diplomacy have failed. Nonviolent methods of conflict resolution are preferred to those that deploy violence. <coughs> now, if the priority of nonviolence to violence connects pacifism and just war doctrine, then where do these two traditions depart? Where do we locate their differences? Childress answers that question by saying that passive 
physicists interpret the value of nonviolence as an absolute duty, one that may not be trumped or overridden. Just war doctrine, in contrast, can interpret nonviolence as generating what is called a prima facie duty, the prima facie duty of non maleficence or the duty not to harm. Now, prima facie duty is a very weighty obligation, but it can be overridden by other stronger obligations. For the just war theorists, the prima facie duty not to kill or harm can be trumped by other duties such as justice. Seen in this way, we can say that just war doctrine is shaped by a strong presumption against killing and war. A presumption that can be overridden under strict circumstances and well-defined situations. A just war then is one in which unjust threats to national security can authorize the transition from nonviolence to violence and have us override the presumption against war. But that authorization, that overriding, is not the last word matter of war ethics speaking. Overriding the prima facie duty of non-maleficence does not mean abandoning it. Rather, that duty leaves moral traces, constraining how we should proceed to act in war. An overridden duty has residual effects on the agent's attitudes and actions. It casts a shadow or exerts pressure on the actions we take in the name of other values in situations of political conflict. It means that we need to stick to or hew to the value of nonviolence as much as we reasonably can, <coughs> even after resorting to war. Now, one advantage to viewing pacifism and just war doctrine in this new way is that it exposes background ideas that structure these two moral traditions. It frees us from thinking that they are entirely incommensurable or incompatible. In addition, it provides a way of organizing perceptions about moral pluralism, moral differences. It has this grasp that the disagreements separate one approach to war from another. It enables us to see, as the U.S. Catholic bishops saw in their 1983 pastoral letter, the challenge of peace, affinities between these two moral frameworks, affinities that exist underneath the large tent of the Christian tradition. And it captures the fact that in the ethics of war, our consciences are often pulled in multiple directions. All of these ideas recommend Childress's contribution to the ethics of war. Now, with these preliminary comments in mind, I want to turn to features in international affairs to explore some practical implications attached to this idea that there's a presumption against war. As I said, the presumption places moral pressure on practice and policy to reduce the harms associated with warfare. If there's a priority of nonviolence to violence, Surely we want to limit the harms that are necessary to defend against injustice. But, ironically, this pressure on the use of force has a downside. That fact emerges when we think about the incentives, the incentive structure that materializes when we put in place, as a matter of policy, the idea that we should reduce the risks and harms of war. To see this, let's note some facts about our current context. Within the last 25 years, there's been a dramatic decrease in state-to-state -state violence and a dramatic increase in asymmetrical war between states and non-state actors. The just war theory was crafted to address conventional warfare in which two opposing but relatively similar armies were engaged in battle. With asymmetric warfare, in contrast, there's only one well-organized army fighting against less well-organized and less well-equipped insurgents. Moreover, an equal
equally important. Today we're taking up questions about, about what are called measures short of war. Such measures, known as the use I <coughs> require lower and more limited uses of force and lack the unpredictable and often catastrophic consequences of a full-scale attack. Compared to acts of conventional war, measures short of war present diminished risks to one's own troops, have a destructive potential that's more predictable and smaller in scale, Survey severely curtail the risk of civilian casualties, and entail a lower economic, and social, and military burden. These two features of our current context, <coughs> asymmetric war and the use of force short of war, define much of the terrain for thinking about the ethics of war today. Understanding our current context can be sharpened if we look at new technologies in international affairs. Today I want to speak about two drone warfare and cyber warfare. When thinking about current policy and practice regarding these matters, <clears throat> we want to, I, I want to show what I'll call the dark side to the presumption against killing war. In addition to the merits of Chilvis' approach that I just mentioned, there are liabilities that accompany the implementation of the presumption against killing war. Operationalizing the presumption against war creates a paradox that we do well to know. To see this paradox, let's consider the use of unmanned combat aerial vehicles, or drones. In November 2002, the CIA carried out the first publicly reported drone strike when Qaid Sinyan al harith an al-Qaeda leader allegedly involved in the bombing of the USS Cole, was killed by a missile fired from a drone in Yemen. Since then, drones have been used to carry out strikes against designated targets in Yemen, Palestine, Afghanistan, Iraq, Somalia, and Libya. Combat drone strikes in Pakistan increased from about 33 in 2008 during the Bush administration to 118 in 2010 under President Obama. Obama's legacy will surely include the uh, surely included the increase in the use of drones in the war against terror. And if Donald Trump follows Obama's policy script, drones will surely remain an important part of the U.S. arsenal. You can see why policy would find drones appealing, <coughs> because drones don't require pilots who would need to return for food and rest and because they can be refueled in mid-air, they can loiter for days. Drones allow for limited, covert, precise strikes as an alternative to a wider, more destructive war requiring more resources and greater risks. And by restricting the use of force to designated targets, drones direct the use of force to specific individuals rather than to standing armies of sovereign states a key advantage in a war against non-state actors. Indeed, so appealing are drones that one commentator has argued that using them is not only an option for the U.S. military, but a moral obligation. Drones are considerably more discriminant than manned weapon, and they reduce risks to U.S. combatants. <coughs> but there are other considerations that ought to chasten our enthusiasm for using drone technology. I'll mention two serious concerns. First, because drones allow for low-risk forms of warfare, drone technology can incentivize and normalize its increased use. The ease of using drone technology might leapfrog over the moral question of whether to use it. By any interpretation of the just war tradition, such a decision process moves too fast. It allows technological capabilities to answer ethical questions. In practical terms, the danger here is that the appeal of using drones can lead us to downplay other aims and tactics, such as capturing our enemies. Simply put, 
drones reduce incentives to capture alleged terrorists. The problem here is not only that drones may produce excess collateral damage, it's also that drone technology limits our strategic focus by reducing incentives to bring alleged terrorists to justice. The 2013 Presidential Policy Guidance Statement says that, quote, the U.S. prioritizes as a matter of policy the capture of terrorism suspects as a preferred option over lethal action and will therefore require a feasibility assessment of capture options as a component of any proposal for lethal action, end quote. Drones tempt leaders to change that priority given the comparatively low risks attached to using them. This problem of incentives is compounded by the fact that drones are being used in covert operations. Note that the first publicly reported use of a lethal drone was by the CIA. Long-term covert warfare lacks transparency, public oversight, and accountability, key virtues of a democratic society. Moreover, as the 2013 Presidential Policy Guidance Procedures make plain, lists have been created to identify high value and other targets to be attacked. The creation, vetting, and assessment of those lists and the decisions they authorize have been kept out of the public eye. Only last year did we receive reports about collateral damage from drone strikes, yet those reports fail to provide the full picture of how lists, targets, and identities are established. Second, drones cannot fully or adequately be assessed in technological terms. One question facing drone technology, although it's not unique to drones, is whether using them poisons the political landscape in which they're used. Unintended casualties from drone strikes are a recruiting boom to extremists. Moreover, drone technology is anonymous and distant, used by armed forces who are seen as unwilling to face their enemies. The question here is whether their use kills terrorists or helps to create them. With any military strategy, both long short and long term consequences must be considered. Much of what has been touted in defense of drones has focused on short term benefits, military rather than political benefits. My second example is cyber warfare. Many of you may remember Iran's cyber attacks in October 2012, when Iran unleashed a series of network attacks against computers in the Saudi oil industry and breached American financial institutions, exposing a cyber war between Iran and the US. Cyber technology poses what is arguably the biggest technological development since the development of intercontinental nuclear weapons for policy and military planning, posing new challenges for the ethics of war. Increasingly, worms, codes, and viruses are being used in coordinated ways by the central commands of governments to hamper or destroy governmental, intellectual, military, and economic operations in another country for political purposes. The use of cyber weapons against Iran began during the Bush administration in 2006 and was enthusiastically embraced by President Obama. In fact, Iran's attack on the US in 2012 was likely in retaliation against a cyber campaign carried about by the US, um, Iran's intense nuclear reactor that caused considerable damage earlier that year. Like drone warfare, cyber warfare represents the use of force short of war, and thus poses some interesting problems. Cyber weaponry allows operators to cripple another country's infrastructure, accomplishing what otherwise would require bombs or boots on the ground to destroy a target. Because they pose few risks to those who use them, cyber weapons, like drones, are tempting to use thus weakening the force 
by the use of I Bellum criteria of last resort. As the U.S. example illustrates, this use of force, short of war, they tend to policy and military leaders to use such force preemptively, thereby initiating an escalating cycle of cyber sabotage. <clears throat> Among the difficult questions in the ethics of war is whether a nation can claim that its sovereignty has been violated by a cyber attack, one that doesn't physically breach its borders. If the answer is yes, Another question concerns the kinds of responses to be considered. Just for doctrine would have us ask if suffering a serious cyber attack enables a state to say that this criterion of last resort has been met and that using military force in self-defense is now justified. Cyber warfare clearly poses fresh challenges for thinking about just cause in the ethics of war. With these questions in mind, in July 2016, the Obama administration released a policy response manual for a major cyber attack that includes a five-level rating system. The first public guide about responses that federal agencies may take in response to a major network breach. The basic just work question is how to cast such a response to which conventional or cyber retaliation might be justified. The White House fact sheet describes a significant cyber attack as one that is, quote, likely to harm national security or economic interests, foreign relations, public confidence, health safety, or civil liberties. And we can imagine other concrete examples. Christopher Everell of the Naval Academy writes, quote, if some hostile party enacts a plan to crash planes full of harmless civilians, it's very plausible to suppose that we have a just cause to respond with military violence. A comparable point applies to destructive attacks on electrical grids, nuclear reactors, and other components of a country's critical infrastructure. Other things being equal, it's morally irrelevant whether a power plant or nuclear reactor is destroyed by a bomb or by the activation of malware by a keystroke." End quote. The point is that a nation's security and vital interests can be put at serious risks by a cyber attack. As with drones with cyber warfare, we're led to ask whether lower risk responses will be the preferred and more frequent options for policymakers and military leaders. There's a pattern in the two examples I've described, and I want to conclude by connecting them to the presumption, to the idea of a presumption against killing and war. In both of my two examples, we're charting somewhat new territory, focusing on questions about asymmetric war and measures short of war. Using targeted drone strikes in Yemen and Pakistan and carrying out cyber attacks against Iran are two examples of asymmetric war or measures short of war or both. Indeed, fighting asymmetric wars with measures short of war defines the political terrain for much of just war theory's future. These forms of engagement reveal that we must carry out careful acts of practical reasoning with an eye to the paradoxes that accompany the ethics of war. Let me briefly say why. Using drone or cyber technology that lowers risks to one's soldiers can weaken the weight of the last resort condition in the use ad bellum and make recourse to war more possible. It lowers the threshold that separates nonviolence from violence. That fact might ironically increase the use of force. In such circumstances, it would seem fair for us to expect a high level of precision and a very strict set of metrics about allowable collateral damage, matters insisted upon by the use in bellow. It also seems fair to first consider non-lethal alternatives to the use of force. Here we see how questions about the proper use of force should cast a shadow 
or exert pressure on decisions to use force before it's used. That's to say there's an internal relation among just work criteria that's an important matter for us to think about. The transition from nonviolence to violence has us ask whether the last resort condition has been properly met, even perhaps especially when resort to force is easier and potentially more discriminant. For the near future, we'll hear more about asymmetric war and measures short of war, which may very well weaken the presumption against killing and war. The future of the just war tradition will most certainly include practical judgments about whether that presumption works to make uses, some uses of force more acceptable and thus paradoxically more frequent. We may be witnessing the triumph of the presumption against war along with the dangers of its success. Operationalizing the presumption against war may work ironically to increase the dangers of war. What may have appeared as a way of connecting just war tradition with the values of pacifism and nonviolence may produce instead a more violent world. The idea of the presumption against war then produces a complex picture theoretically and practically. At the theoretical level, it enables us to embrace moral pluralism by revealing what pacifism and just war doctrine have in common. I myself have found Professor Childress's contribution productive at the theoretical level for thinking about the ethics of war and peace and the values that these traditions of pacifism and just war have in common. At a practical level, however, the presumption raises complicated questions given the creation of new technologies. It can incentivize uses of force that are more precise and less risky and thus more desirable. Making the use of force more desirable may weaken our commitment to honor the values of nonviolence. That is to say, the presumption against war is a relatively new idea in just war thinking. But like so many matters in the ethics of war, it pulls our consciences in multiple directions. Thank you.